Okay, now I'm gonna start talking about polarity. First, we're gonna talk about polarity of bonds, and then we're gonna look at how polarity of bonds overall impacts the polarity of molecules. So first I need to discuss what electronegativity is. Electronegativity is just a property of um, an element. Okay, so there's trends on the periodic table and I'll point that out in a second, but it really is just the property of an element. And it's the ability of that atom to pull electron density towards itself in a covalent bond. So there, this is still a covalent bond. There's still two atoms next to each other where those two electrons are overlapped and they're moving back and forth. So you can't see me making my, you know, motions here, but there are, the electrons are moving back and forth between the two of them. In a uh, situation in which there's no electronegativity difference, those electrons are shared equally. They spend the same amount of time around each one of the atoms. But when there's an electronegativity difference, the electrons that are shared spend more time around the atom that is more electronegative. So how the trend in electronegativity works is that it increases this way across the periodic table and it increases up the periodic table. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom. The reason it's not hydrogen is because hydrogen is a noble gas and it typically does not make um, uh, covalent compounds and so there's no reason that it would hog electrons more than another atom that it is bonded to because it doesn't make bonds. So fluorine is the most electronegative and how it works is there always is kind of like a competition. If you are over in the competition you are more electronegative. If you are up in the competition you are more electronegative. Things get a little bit complicated um, if you mix it. Usually I try to keep it as straightforward as you can. The exceptions. Hydrogen. And carbon. Have basically the same electronegativity. And I'll explain that again as we keep going. So carbon and hydrogen have basically the same electronegativity. So let's look and see what happens between um, hydrogen and fluorine. And if you'll notice, I am not drawing the lone pair of electrons on that fluorine. I'm really just focused on the bond between hydrogen and fluorine. Those are the two electrons that are shared. So if we look and see in our periodic table, we see that fluorine, again, is the most electronegative. It is further over to the right than hydrogen is. That means the two electrons that are shared are shared unequally. And the hydrogen pulls the electron density towards itself. If it pulls the electron density towards itself, that means the electrons spend more time around the fluorine. If the electrons spend more time around the fluorine, that means that the fluorine carries a partial negative charge. So that thing that I just drew there is a lowercase Greek D. It means a little bit. So a partial negative charge is on the fluorine, and that means that there's a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. That's why my arrow here has that little plus sign at the, uh, the other end. And again, if you were looking at me, I would be showing you that you're pulling the electron density towards the fluorine. It's almost like there's a tug of war going on. Hydrogen is a little tiny itty bitty guy. Fluorine is a little, is a big gigantic burly man. If fluorine is a big gigantic burly man and they started a tug of war, that is going to be moving towards the big burly guy. The little teeny tiny guy is going to fall over. That's what I mean by it's pulling electron density towards itself. And again, it's just talking about the electrons that are in the bond. The electrons that are in the bond between hydrogen and fluorine spend more time around fluorine, giving fluorine a partial negative charge hydrogen a partial positive charge. This is called a polar covalent bond. Polar because the electrons are shared unequally, covalent because electrons are still shared, and a bond because they're, you know, stuck together. Okay, how is that different from two hydrogen atoms? 
Well, if we look at the bond between two hydrogen atoms, there's no electronegativity difference between them. They have the same want for the electrons that are shared. So this is like two medium-sized guys in a tug of war. Two perfectly equally sized guys in a tug of war. And you know, they put like a little flag in the middle. If those two guys who are perfectly matched in the tug of war start pulling, it's not going anywhere, right? Unless one of the guys falls over, unless, you know, one of the guys gets help from something, it's not going anywhere. Those two electrons are shared completely evenly. They spend equal amounts of time between both atoms. This is called a nonpolar covalent bond. It's nonpolar because there's no difference in electronegativity. There's no partial positive or partial negative, And it's covalent because the electrons are shared. Okay, so what about between O and H? And again, I'm not showing anything else going on. I'm not showing any lone pairs. I'm just focusing on that bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. All right, let's go over the periodic table. Oxygen is right here. Hydrogen is right here. So oxygen is further to the right than the hydrogen is. So that means that oxygen is the big burly dude in the tug of war and oxygen pulls the electron density towards it. The electrons in that bond spend more time around the oxygen. That leaves the hydrogen partially positive and the oxygen partially negative. That again is a polar covalent bond. One more that I want to talk about, because I, I almost forgot about this exception, is carbon and hydrogen. And again, I know on the periodic table, they look like they should be different. It looks like carbon should have more electronegativity than hydrogen, but it does not. In practice, really, there's no real electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen. The electrons are shared equally. Let me write that down because that's important. If the electrons that are in that bond are shared equally, that means that it is a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay, so it's really important to note when a bond is polar or nonpolar. So this is how you can tell. Look at the periodic table. Further to the right, more electronegative pulls the electron density towards itself. All right, now I just have some images of this. This is exactly like what I told you about with the HF. Fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it pulls the electron density. The electrons spend more time around the hydrogen. I'm sorry, the electrons spend more time around the fluorine. That's why it's partially negative, because it's more electronegative. The electrons spend more time around the oxygen. Oxygen pulls the electron density towards itself, leaving hydrogen partially positive. Now we have to look at the molecule as a whole and we're going to talk about, okay, let's look at these polar bonds and see how these polar bonds um, impact molecules. And the most important thing about polarity of molecules is the shape matters. So I talk all the time about how chemistry builds on itself. Well, here's another thing. We, we just can't forget about shape. Um, the shape matters. You have to think in three dimensions in order to figure out if a molecule is polar or nonpolar. If the polar bonds are equal and opposite, they cancel. If they cancel, then that would lead to a nonpolar situation. If the polar bonds are not equal but opposite, then the molecule overall is polar. Okay, so we're looking for things to cancel. And again, you can think about it as a tug of war. If, for example, we had a three-way tug of war. So this is my flag here. That's what a flag looks like. And let's say that we had a three-way tug of war going on. And, oh my goodness gracious. If in the three-way tug of war, um, it's completely equally spaced out. 
So we have one guy here. And again, you'll have to believe me that it's completely equal, right? If this were a molecule, this would be trig planar. Three equal things. Let's say that they're all the same atom, so there's no electronegativity difference between anything. And if these three guys were all the same size and they started pulling equally, that flag is not going to move. If that flag is not going to move, then overall the molecule is nonpolar. So if everything is equal and opposite and cancels out, nonpolar. Let's have another situation. Here's my flag. It's going to be a three-way tug of war, but we're going to have a big burly dude, an atom that is very electronegative, equally spaced out from two normal looking dudes. They all start pulling at the same time. They all start pulling at the same time. That flag is going to move. That big burly dude is going to pull the electron density towards itself. Even those little guys who are pulling, even though there's two of them down there, since it's equally spaced out, that big burly dude is going to win. Since that big burly dude is going to win, this molecule overall is polar. So if they cancel, nonpolar. If they do not cancel, polar. So then the question is, is water polar? And I would tell you guys to draw it. I'm going to draw it showing shape. So this is a water molecule. And if you remember, water molecule, two, bond, two atoms and two lone pairs is bent, has a bond angle of 105 degrees. Now, in order to figure out if this molecule is polar or nonpolar, first you have to ask yourself, how many polar bonds are there? There are two polar bonds. Oxygen pulls the electron density towards itself in the hydrogen-oxygen bond to the left. Oxygen pulls the electron density over to itself from the hydrogen on the right. So there are two polar bonds. Now, take a step back and look at the molecule as a whole and say, okay, do those polar bonds cancel? <clears throat> they do not. They are not equal and opposite. They're both sort of pointing in the overall up direction. Since they're both pointing overall up, the molecule overall is polar. Those bonds do not cancel. Those polar bonds add together in order to make the molecule overall polar. But this is where you have to be careful because if you were not careful and you just drew water looking like this, you might say to yourself, well, Oxygen pulls the electron density towards itself. Oxygen pulls the electron density towards itself. Ah, they cancel. The way this guy is drawn, it's drawn looking like the molecule is linear. It absolutely looks like the bonds cancel. So you might be tempted to say, well, this molecule is nonpolar because those bonds cancel. They're pointing at each other. They're equal and opposite, but because the molecule is bent, because of the geometry, the molecule is absolutely polar. This is incorrect because it does not take the shape into account. All right, here is a water molecule. You can kind of ignore what's going on with these numbers, but water is polar. This has a partial negative charge. The oxygen has a partial negative charge because it's the electronegative atom. These hydrogens are partially positive because the oxygen pulls the electron density towards itself. The electrons spend more time around the oxygen, making it um, partially negative. All right, so now is, this is um, chloroform, gosh could think for a second. This is a molecule of chloroform. We can't name it using our normal nomenclature because this is not a binary compound. We have carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine. So is this compound polar or not? You have to draw it. There's no shortcut here. You have to draw these molecules in order to be able to tell if it's polar or not. So carbon is for, so pause the video here.
draw chloroform, figure out how many polar bonds it has, and then figure out if those polar bonds cancel or don't cancel. After you try it on your own, then come back and check yourself. All right, carbon has four valence electrons, hydrogen has one, each one of the chlorines has seven. So that's four plus one plus 21 gives us 26 electrons. Carbon goes in the middle and we're gonna bond, uh, I'm gonna draw this very specifically so it lines up with what my next slide looks like. Remember, um, well, let me just keep drawing it and then we'll get there. That takes care of two, four, six, eight electrons. Fill in octets, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. Now take a step back. Carbon has a full octet. Each one of the chlorines has a full octet. Hydrogen has a full duet. Okay, so now what is the shape around that carbon? The shape around that carbon is tetrahedral. It has a 109.5 degree bond angle. You just have to memorize these things. Because around that carbon there are four atoms and no lone pairs. So I'm kind of trying to draw this with some shape to it. I talked about the dashes and the wedges in one of the other videos. The ones that are plain bonds are in the plane of the paper. The big wedge is coming out at you. The other one, the one that stashes, is going away. Now, how many polar bonds are there in the molecule? There are three polar bonds. Remember, there's no electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen. But chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. In all of those cases, the chlorine pulls the electron density towards itself. That leaves our chlorines partially negative and our carbon is partially positive. So three polar bonds. Now, do those three polar bonds cancel or not? Remember, this is tetrahedrally shaped, so it kind of looks like a tripod and like a thing coming up off the tripod. This is not canceled. Those polar bonds are not canceled. Polar bonds not canceled. Since those polar bonds are not canceled, the molecule overall is polar. Alright. And there it is. So here's, oh, sorry. Here's our hydrogen. Here are our chlorines. Overall, the molecule has those chlorines sort of down and it pulls the electron density down towards itself. So it is, yes, a polar molecule. What about carbon tetrachloride? Again, you should pause here, draw the Lewis structure, figure out how many, oh, the shape figure out how many polar bonds, and figure if those polar bonds cancel or not. I'm going to cut to the chase. Here is what the valid Lewis structure looks like for carbon tetrachloride. And again, I'm trying to draw shape. This is tetrahedral. It has a geometry of 109.5 degrees. It has four polar bonds. The chlorines are all more electronegative than the carbon. Now this is really hard to see. Do those polar bonds cancel? And the answer is yes. Because the bonds are symmetric. I'm going to call it perfectly symmetric. They cancel. They are all equal and opposite one another. Since they are all equal and opposite one another, they cancel. 
So overall, this molecule is nonpolar. And sorry, here is an example of that. It is not polar. All those bonds are equal and opposite and they cancel out. Um, here's practice for you. Is carbon dioxide polar or non? Non. So again, I recommend that you pause, figure out what carbon dioxide looks like, figure out the shape, number of polar bonds, and then if they cancel or do not cancel. So is carbon dioxide polar or nonpolar? I'm gonna cut to the chase. Here's what carbon dioxide looks like. I'm drawing it with its shape showing. This is linear. It has a 180 degree bond angle. It has two polar bonds. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. That leaves the carbon is partially positive and the oxygens is partially negative. But they're equal and opposite each other. They absolutely cancel. Since they cancel, carbon dioxide is nonpolar. All right, that's all I am going to talk about for this class. We'll start with the next stuff in the next class, and I will see you on Friday. Any questions? As always, let me know.